I'm Ellen Brown, president of the Rotary Club of Harrisburg. We're part of an international community and humanitarian service organization comprised of 1.4 million members in over 44,000 clubs in more than 200 countries. Rotary leads the world in volunteer service. For more than 112 years, the Rotary Club of Harrisburg has organized impactful local service projects that changes lives and creates hope where it's needed most. Please join us at a Rotary luncheon at the Hilton, service on a Monday, or a Rotary alternate meeting to meet our members who are waiting to welcome you. You can find out more about us at hbgrotary.org. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope to welcome you as a member soon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, brings me great pleasure uh, today to introduce someone that I've actually known for 20 years, we say, go back uh, previous to our hometowns and home region back in the greater Susquehanna Valley. Joanne Troutman is the Chief Operating Officer of Youth Advocates Program Incorporated, a nonprofit headquartered here in Harrisburg, just up the street and road from the chamber on Front Street, um, but also started here in Harrisburg as well. Prior to her position as COO, she was the Director of Social Impact Programs for External Education at Cornell University. She brought partners together to create equitable and innovative educational programs around the world. This included education for refugees and women, workforce development for low-income adults, prison education, support for minority-serving institutions, and college programs in Title I high schools. Prior to that, she was president and CEO of the Greater Susquehanna Valley United Way for six years, where she began initiatives to address the opioid crisis, youth mental health, trauma, and coordinated the region's COVID-19 public health response. Joanne also transformed this United Way from a grant maker into a collective impact organization where I got to know her and witnessed um, her diplomacy skills first time and making that incredible uh, transition for the region. And her team grew revenue there at the United Way by 500%. She holds an undergraduate degree in journalism from Susquehanna University and a master's degree in management and leadership. Joanne is a proud native of the coal region and a lifelong resident of central Pennsylvania. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Joanne Troutman. It's a lovely surprise this morning um, to see Ryan. Uh, we do go way back and it's sort of, we've kind of floated in and out of the same circles throughout our careers. Um, but I'm, I'm really uh, honored and pleased to be here. And I've gotten this uh, invitation to come from Susan to talk about youth advocate programs, which in my um, experience is one of the best kept secrets um, in Harrisburg, as well as maybe the whole state of Pennsylvania. Um, we're going to, Sean, you have your, pull, pull that up. We have, I have a couple slides for you. Um, it's been a while. I haven't spoken to a Rotary Club since I left the United Way. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me here a little bit. It's actually my first official YAP presentation. I joined YAP back in July. Uh, Craig and I actually were friends on Facebook <laughs> because I know his brother from my United Way days prior to that. So we kind of joined YAP within a month of each other and we were kind of lamenting all the changes that have happened even in a short period of time. Um, our, our headquarters are located on at uh, 3899 North Front. You may know that building because it was the Pennsylvania Newspaper Association. Um, our, that is our operations center. And as COO, I am the um, the kind of the run that that those headquarters. But we we have a national, really a global workforce. So we have over two thousand employees across the company. Um, most of those are direct service workers, and I'll talk about a little bit about what that means in a few minutes. Um, but we're really proud to be here in Harrisburg. Um, we serve, as the slide says, 17,800 families, just, just shy of about 18,000 18, families this year. Um, our goal is by um, 2027, we will have served, we will be serving over 20,000 kids a year, which is pretty remarkable given the scope of the work that we do. The vast majority of the kids that we serve um, are young men of color, teenagers of color. Um, and so, you know, it's it's been interesting. I've spent 25 years of my career in nonprofit work. Um, there are a lot of organizations who wish they could do what YAP does. We're doing it. 
we're doing it and we're doing it at a very hyper local level. We're doing it effectively. Um, and you know, we're, we're really good at what we do, um, but we're not really good at talking about it. And so it's part of the reason that I'm excited that I'm here. Uh, most of the kids that we serve are teenagers and Craig's going to speak a cup and uh, give us a few minutes about the work that he does at our Dauphin County CTC, where he is a program director um, between the ages of 14 and 17. We do go a little bit beyond that, especially with community level violence programs, um, as well as, you know, we have a clinic here on Third Street uh, in Harrisburg. Um, and behavioral health is, is, is a, a function of what we do. Um, we've got a, about 50% of our business right now is, is behavioral health work, primarily in the state of Pennsylvania, but really all across the country. Um, how do we do it? Well, the, the, the core function of uh, youth advocates, and I'll actually go back here a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk uh, first about, about why we're located in Harrisburg. So we were actually founded uh, close to 50 years ago. We're going to be cel celebrating our 50th anniversary in um, 2025. We were founded by Tom Jeffers in response to uh, the mass closure in 1975 of many juvenile uh, incarceration facilities across the state of Pennsylvania. You know, it used to be, and this was not just for uh, kids who were who were charged with crime, but also, as you well know, anybody you know, uh, individuals, adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, the list is long. I mean, the, the the thought process was you you put people away and you lock them away, and then nobody sees them and nobody has to deal with that, right? And so, of course, um, back in the seventies, eighties, we started to get wise to the fact that that probably really wasn't working. Uh, what would happen is, you know, kids would go into these facilities and they were not getting the help that they needed. Kids don't commit crimes because they're bad people. Nobody commits a crime pretty much because they're a bad person, right? They do it because something happened to them. That's a, it's a different approach. That is a trauma approach. And, and what we know now about um, people's behaviors and youth behaviors is when you experience a high level of trauma, especially at an early age, that's going to affect the way that your brain develops. Does anybody want to hazard a guess right now of what is the average age of brain maturation for an adult male. Vlad's going to tell me. 25. Interestingly, that's what's on the books right now. And that's changing. They're actually finding that um, neuroscience, which is a fairly new field, somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of 28 to 29 years old for men, 25, 26 is for, for women. And so the fact that we've been locking up young boys young girls even, for many, many years, it disproportionately affects um, communities of color is, is kind of shocking and heartbreaking and alarming um, for a lot of reasons. I could talk about that for days. It's a personal passion of mine, um, but but it's, it's really um, at the heart of why YAT does what it does. Again, we're one of the best kept secrets, I think, in, in the Harrisburg area. Um, Tom founded us. We were we had very humble beginnings and were extremely, extreme, extremely, uh, very much on a on a shoestring budget. Still are. Uh, we're a nonprofit that never changes. But we were able to get an infusion of funding. Um, I want to say probably about seven years ago from the Bomber Foundation. Michael Bomber gave us a twenty million dollar grant, and that has been. Um, we we just are the recipient of a second twenty million dollar grant that we're in the midst of with them, and that's been able to allow us to invest in infrastructure. We were able to buy the building on Front Street close up those old inefficient uh, Victorian homes that really weren't serving us anymore um, in the middle of uh, the city. What is our mission? We are founded, as you probably have guessed, to provide alternatives to incarceration and foster care um, for kids. That's essentially the bottom line. We want to keep kids out of congregant care. We want to keep them in their communities. We want to teach them how to how to engage with their communities, engage with their schools, and just that there's a different way. There's a better way. And there are different decisions that they can make. And we do that through our advocate model. The idea is that you match one advocate who has lived experience. What makes YAP unique and different um, when I look at it at, at our organization as a whole is that we're able to hi do neighborhood-based hiring, and we are able to hire people who have lived experience. Not a lot of nonprofits want to take that risk, uh, which I always think is a little bit laughable, right? Um, given the work that nonprofits are charged with, we do it. We don't talk about it. We just do it. We hire advocates in neighborhoods. We create jobs in neighborhoods in places like Philadelphia, Chicago, LA. Um, and, and again, we do it pretty darn effectively. 
we don't just support kids, we support their families as well. Um, and I'll talk about our yeah, RAP model in just a second. We're right now officially in 35 states. We're having conversations with uh, three other states. So the hope is before long, we'll be in 38 states. We're actually um, have affiliate agreements and training relationships with five international organizations, Guatemala, Sierra Leone, um, which as you can imagine, that looks like a very different model in those places. But we're also in Australia, Sweden, and Ireland. We have a very robust program in Ireland, actually. And we're looking to expand our international footprint, um, trying to kind of change our thinking to really go where we're needed and, and to not to, to recognize that we're not the ones who necessarily may be needing to deliver that service. We want to create culturally competent um, strategies in various neighborhoods and communities all over the world. And um, from my uh, experience at Cornell, I can tell you it's badly, badly needed. Uh, again, 100% of our, our programming occurs in the home uh, communities of the people that we serve. And that means we do have a pretty remote workforce. That's a challenge for me as a COO for a lot of reasons. We have, of those 2,200 people we have working for YAP, only about 700 of us are full-time. The rest are part-time. The vast majority of them are, are therapists, advocates, um, we, you know, we social workers, you name it, we have working in communities. And most times it's a second job for them. They do it for not the money. I can tell you that they do it because it's their passion. You know, what social, I dare you to find a social worker that does their work for, for money. Um, but we, we also, we also provide, um, this support in secure settings. I find myself talking a lot about, um, going, you know, making sure that, that our families and our staff are safe. It's a problem. I mean, there's a real challenge because we do, there's a lot of group violence in the communities where we work, including here in Harrisburg, right? Um, Craig and I were just discussing, you know, how, how important that is and how, you know, when, even when we're hiring, we, we hire people who look and have the same, look like, and have the same experience that our kids have, um, that we're able to create, you know, by memberships or places like the boys and girls clubs or the YMCA, because those tend to be neutral locations. Locations. These are all things that I've learned since coming to, yeah, visited Wilmington, Delaware, and we looked at a space a couple of months ago and our program director there said to me, no, we can't, we can't, we can't rent that space. It's affordable. It fits the budget, but frankly, it's just in the wrong part of town. You know, we know that our kids in this group aren't going to come to this side of town and the kids over here aren't going to allow that. And it's just a recipe for disaster. And that's why it's, it's so vitally important to hire um, in the neighborhoods where we work. I already talked about how many um, we serve. So so yeah, in individual service planning, um, anyone who's done social work or even education, if you've ever been, any of you have been in education? I know Susan's been in education. So you know, right? You know that every child is different. Um, every family has a unique need. Um, and we address that right at the start by develop, working with the, the, the participant and their family around an individual service plan. So everybody kind of sits around the table and um, creates this sort of, bubble for lack of a, uh, a better word in our yap rap model to make sure kids and their families have access um, to the services that they need you know and I know this from United my United way work if you can f solve a food insecurity solve a housing insecurity you're gonna be much more likely to get get at the root cause if somebody has to worry about where they're sleeping tonight or what they're eating or whether they're eating today they're not going to be thinking about what their college plans are that's for darn sure right and so sometimes we lose sight of that um I saw a meme this weekend that said, yeah, sure, we can teach a man to fish, but how about we give them a fish and then teach them how to fish because it's much easier to fish when you're not hungry. And that spoke to me. You know, when I did work at United Way, um, I've kind of, I've never been a social worker, but I sort of fell into, you know, more or less being an advocate. And I was on call all the time and I'd be the one the police would call on a Friday night at 8 p.m. when they found somebody living on the street when it was 14 degrees outside, right? And we don't, have homeless shelters that are available in the greater Susquehanna Valley. And so, you know, my, my, that, that immediate solution was always easy. You take them to the hotel, I will pay for it, send them and, you know, I'll go pick them up Monday morning and they'll come into our office and they'll talk to a community action case manager. That initial solution is, is easy. Cause really that's just about money. That's an easy fix. What's harder is being able to figure out how to engage that person to help drive toward a long-term solution. I, I always think it's hilarious that we're well, maybe not hilarious, ironic that we're, we argue about that first step. That's always the argument, right? Let's, let's not, you know, why, why are you doing that for them? You're enabling them all that. That's not what we should be arguing about. We should be arguing about the cause. We should be engaged in discourse around how do we create better solutions for communities and families. 
And that's really what we do on, on a large scale as well as, as well as on a hyper-local scale, yeah. So our advocates work in schools, work in communities. We get referrals all over the place, um, you know, and, and we do have different levels of service in every community, depending on the program and depending on the need of that uh, child and that family. And that's part of what the ISP is all about. But we do, I mean, we, we've had kids, unfortunately, who've lost their lives due to gang violence or drugs or suicide. Um, that's just an unfortunate reality of the, of the, the families and the, and the participants that we serve. And we have advocates going out to homes at two and three o'clock in the morning to have those conversations and support those families. They're doing the real work. Um, and it's, it's really kind of humbling to see. Um, our outcomes are pretty phenomenal. And we're actually working, we just hired a vice president of research who will be working across the company um, to look at every, literally every program and every outcome that we have. 96% of the participants we serve are not uh, convicted or adjudicated of a new offense while in our program. Uh, that's pretty remarkable if you know the, the data and the statistics. 87% um, are leaving, living safely in the community at discharge. That, that means that their housing is secure. It, it does, means that they're not living on the streets, that they know where they're going to sleep tonight, and their family is supporting them. Anybody who knows or has had uh, family members who've struggled with um, crime or substance use disorder, you know that one of the hardest things is continuing to support that person when you lose that trust. YAP is a big piece of building trust within families and within communities. Um, and then 88% are regularly attending school or have grad graduated with their with their GED um, or diploma at discharge. Uh, and I, I've seen this repeatedly, right? When you have a um, someone who doesn't have a high school diploma, doesn't have their GED, they can't even get a job at a place like Walmart half the time. I mean, it, it really is one of the biggest, greatest barriers that, that communities face. Um, this is kind of the breakdown of our services. And this is not necessarily... Um, the kinds of kids that we serve. Uh, so I, I, I'm, we're always really careful um, to ensure that people know um, most of the participants that we serve have been affected by more than one of these bubbles, if you will. This is just sort of how we get our referrals and how we get paid. Our con we have 90% of our contracts are government contracts. We're working to change that. We actually don't get a ton of private philanthropy and we're putting a lot of resources in that because we know, especially with government the way it is, it's a little bit um, arbitrary at times and, and difficult to predict that that we do need to have other sources of revenue so that we can support we can support those things like food and housing and security. We can support literacy programs for kids, those those real barriers that are preventing them from having a future. But but the vast major, vast majority of our uh, referrals and funding comes through juvenile justice. Um, and, and adult reentry programs, it's almost half. Uh, we have a growing child welfare uh, body of work, uh, foster care, kids who are either in foster care or are, are at risk of going into foster care. And um, although it's kind of difficult for some of us to, to wrap our, our minds around it, um, child welfare and foster care, you know, what, what we find is kinship care is much more effective than putting a child in the foster care system. Um, you know, I think most folks who don't know and don't work with um, individuals who've been in, involved with child welfare often think, well, just take them away from their parents. They're inept. And I'm here to tell you that that child statistically is going to be much more, much more successful if they stay with their birth family, whether that's grandma or aunt or uncle. Repeated studies have shown that. Um, and so that that's why our Pennsylvania courts are really focusing on kinship care above all else. Um, and then, you know, we do a lot of school based. Most of our behavioral health is actually school based. We get our referrals from from schools. Um, our yeah, rat model is exactly what I talked about. It's not just uh, making sure that family feels um, supported, that they feel loved, that they feel valued, and that we're getting them access to the services and supports that they need. And that's reflected in their individual service plan. Uh, cultural and linguistic competence uh, is really important, right? You know, making sure that we have, we have advocates who quite literally speak their language. Um, and then ensuring that we're, we're producing uh, staff and families who are trauma informed. When you see a child come into the system, probably 98% of the time, it's because their family has some type of family level trauma and it's generational, right? Uh, we'd like to think that that gets better over time, but rarely does it without some level of intervention. Uh, I'm a trauma trainer and I will live and die on this mountain. We need to make sure that we're addressing that, that root cause trauma and we're interrupting it for families, whether it's a Yat family or anybody else. Um, 
some of the things that make Yap successful is that holistic approach. But I do want to mention that we work really hard to make sure the advocates that we're matching with kids um, and participants understand them. Again, that they maybe have lived experience. They look like them. They speak like them. They know what the neighborhood is like. That is not easy, especially in this workforce right now. That is, We struggle to recruit and retain just like anybody else does. And part of the reason is that people don't get paid a lot of money to do this work. And we can't convince the courts to give us more than 15 or $18 an hour for an individual, which is a tough sell when you're, you, know, you can go to McDonald's and quite literally make 21 or $22 an hour hourly. So that is something we're actively working on that if ISCOO can work to on strategies that make it more efficient to, to figure out how we can really support the people who are actually in the communities doing work. I already talked about trauma. I won't bore you with that. Um, the other thing that we really, we, we really focus on is economic opportunities. And this is another uh, piece of our work that is is growing pretty rapidly. Our YAP works model and our supported work model is is we're getting a lot of um, requests to kind of incorporate that. There aren't a whole lot of nonprofits that will do supported work. And what I mean by supported work is that you have a participant who enrolls in the program and they go out into the community, maybe one of your businesses, right? MNT Bank, Sean, like I'd send a, a participant to MNT Bank and they'd be your intern and they'd work with you in the office and we would pay them. We pay them through grant dollars typically. Um, and they get valuable experience and it's usually a, um, a limited scope, you know, a certain number of hours. Um, and then there's reflection as part of that. They get soft skills. They have to show up on time. Vlad and I were talking about that earlier. All, all of those things that you think about all the things that you say, those darn millennials, right? They just can't show up to work on time. It's because they were never taught that, right? We have to teach that. We have to instill that. What is work and what, what are realistic work expectations? We have found early evidence. We have a study going on in the state of New York with our child welfare program there. And this is not a shock to any of you, but we have the data around it that a, a participant is going to be wildly more successful if they're matched with an advocate and a work experience. We always knew that to be the case, right? But now we know it. Now we can prove it. And we're hoping to be able to um, expand that case for support. Um, so just as Craig's coming up here, because I do want Craig to talk just a little bit about his experience with YAP, but um, I just have a, a quick interactive quiz for you. So I've done work with um, insiders who are lifers. I've done work with um, lots of kids around behavioral health, substance use disorder, all of that. Do you want to hazard a guess the most common age that I've heard of a child who uh, grows into adulthood with substance use disorder? What age do you think they first try a substance? 12, I hear 12. Somebody said eight. It's close, nine. Nine years old, third grade, third grade, you guys. So when the next time you hear somebody say, don't teach kids about drugs, they don't want to hear it. That's bull. It's all bull. Um, problem solving brain development peaks at age nine. It still continues, as you know. That's the that's the frontal lobe, right? This is the making good decisions, right? This is the one that matures last. That continues to grow, but the most rapid period of growth is up until age, the age of nine. What at what age? So let me let me ask you this. Before the age of five, how much of the brain develops before the age of five? You know this because of Elik. You should know this. How much, what percentage of the brain develops before the age of five? You're very close. 90, 90%. So if you have kids who aren't being read to, aren't being engaged, those synapses aren't firing, forget it. I always say to my high school, my friends who are high school teachers, by the time that these kids get to you, they need an advocate because you can't do this in the classroom. So it's not possible. I like to think anything's possible, but it's not possible with the level of trauma that they've experienced. Anybody want to hazard a guess the age? So if I'm working with my lifer, lifers, very unscientific sample, the average age by which they told me, or they tell me that they were first justice involved. So they started getting into trouble at 12, the first time they were arrested at age 14. And they've been in and out of incarceration since then. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Craig because he's more interesting than I am anyway. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I would like to say thank you publicly to my boss because she helps us do um, the things that are important to us and gives us a facility where we have our heat and all that stuff, which is a big deal. So thank you very much. I don't know if I say that enough. Um, I want to tell you a story. The kid's name I'm making up, is his name is Lamont. And last, uh, about three months ago, he was involved in a fight at our program. And I, I'm in there separating him from the other kid. He literally had vengeance in his eyes and was trying to go through the door that I stood in front. 
And as I, as I had to wrestle him down to the ground, I held him. And he said, get the f of me, Mr. Mr. Craig. They called me Mr. Craig or they called me O-Head, whatever, whatever they choose. But he said, get off of me. And I said, I can't do that because he wasn't de-escalated. And as I held him, I started to loosen my body weight on him and the tears just flooded down his eyes and he cried. And I went into my office and cried after that. Because the backstory of that is that I, I got all of his, his records. I read them the first day he got there. They found him at one point outside at a neighbor's eating plums off the ground because he didn't have food in a dirty diaper. This is, and it's, it's stack for children and youth goes back. What chance does that child have? What chance? And I call them child purposely because we want to say they have done some adult things and that may be true, but they're still children. I still tell them good job. My job all day is just to, just to plant seeds and hope that somebody else will come along and water those seeds so that the kids have a chance, so that we're not paying for them to go to jail, so that maybe we could just help one or two kids and most, I have out of the nine kids in my program now, I have three that have been victims of gun violence. And I have one that has been a shooter. So where do you think they got the guns from? Where do you think they got the values that their life is unimportant from? All we do is try to build relationships because we know that if we accept them at their worst, we have the opportunity to maybe bring out the best in them. And then when I want to get mad at the parents, just when I see one parent doing something idiotic and I just want to get so mad and say, don't you realize what you're doing to your child? Then I hear about the parents' backstory and what was done to them and how they were treated as children. And then I no longer have anyone to be angry at. So I just join up with the good people that are going to help us reach out and make a difference, an impact. I'm a boy from the Bronx, and I had a yap before. It wasn't called yap. It was some man in the church who took my dad and taught him how to box, right? Took him to the YMCA. My dad was a street guy and all that. Took him to the YMCA and taught him how to box. It was no yap. It was just one person trying to help out a young man. And they look like me. They got dreadlocks like I do. And they know the, the latest rap. Half the times, I don't even know all the slang. I feel like it changes every day. But this is what I do know. If I can build a relationship with them and let them know that one person cares about them, that maybe that can make a difference in their life. And I will do it for that one person. I'll do it for the one kid because their life is valuable and we have an opportunity to do something. I would much rather my money go on the side of prevention as a teenager than just to incarcerate them for the rest of their life as an adult. Last week, we had a kid who graduated our program shot in the back, still on life support in a coma in a local hospital, shot in the back. He was a graduate from our program. We pray for them. This is the type of things that are already going on in our community. When you guys partner with us, you help us make a difference. And we may not help all, everybody through the program, but we're going to try. And that money, believe this, the money that I spend, I squeeze every single cent out of it because it helps us reach more and more kids. I did not choose this job. This job chose me. I got a bachelor's of arts in sociology 30 years ago. Never used it, but only to get better jobs. And then finally, I get the one job where I can use it every single day. I'd be so glad all my student loans are paid off. But we're making a difference. And sometimes the parents, I thought as a young black man, I'm 54, but I thought as a black man that they would embrace me. Some of them never had dad around and they're angry with that. So I come up in here, smiling and whistling and they're so angry because dad left them and never showed up. I get the worst treatment. I said, where did that come from? I thought they would love me. I am your people. They said, dad left me. I never knew who my dad was. He left us. He went to jail for 20 years. And so I'm the first opportunity they have to build a relationship and we're going to do our best. We're going to do our best to work with these kids because we know we answer to a higher authority. And when we, when my time on this earth is done, I want to know that we tried, that we made an effort to help these kids because they deserve a chance. So thanks a lot for letting me share.